Okay, um, I just put this up as a reminder of uh, where we are. Uh, we're calling the layers below the uh, abstract interface, calling those machine implementation, or maybe machine organization. This is actually how you build the computer, or the physical stuff. But this is an abstraction, and it's the combination of the hardware and, how can I say, what it does. This is the hardware, this is what it does as presented to the software. So the whole thing is what's called computer architecture. Now, the title of our course is computer organization. So you might think, oh, we're only going to look here. But in fact, that's not true. We're going to look here. But a better title for the course would be Introduction to Computer Architecture. I think everybody knows there's another course, CS422, which is called Computer Architecture. And it's an advanced, deeper level look at processors and, and uh, memory and I.O. systems and parallelism and ways to make the thing be very high performance. So after this course, you'll be able to take that course if you want to. It's given by Ozjan Ozturk, the teacher of the other section. He worked for Intel on multi-core chips. He's an expert in the area. His research is in that area. So I really encourage you. It's, it's been a popular course now. It's been open the last two years. And students are really enjoying going deeper into hardware uh, when it's taught well. And I think he teaches it very well. So uh, our course really should be titled Introduction to Computer Architecture because we're doing all this. We're going to be looking very much at the level of uh, the layer that interfaces with the software. In fact, we'll even be going up a bit from there. So we're going to be all over the architecture of a computer, uh, not only focused just on the organization and the hardware. That's what I want to say. But this slide focuses just on the organization and the hardware, so let's, let's go up for it. The organization and the hardware would be what a logic designer would see when they look at a computer. The function units and their interconnects below the ISA level. In other words, this stuff here. The function units and their interconnects and how the logic is designed. And so uh, they'll be concerned with, and at this level a view would be concerned with, the performance characteristics of the principal function units. The capabilities of things like registers, ALU, shifters, logic units, etc. And then the ways in which those units are interconnected together with buses and tri-state and uh, control logic. And then how information, yani data, or control flows between the components and the logic and means by which the information is controlled and the choreography or how the dance, you know, choreography is a word from the world of dance, how the dance is coordinated between these different function units in order to realize the whole ISA. In other words, if you put these pieces together in the right way, you get this. That's, that's what the meaning is. So you, it's, you cannot ignore the... Uh, organization level. Um, it's the way in which the computer is built. And uh, you can describe it in register transfer language. Remember we did some work with RTL in the last part of the CS223 course. Well now you can describe with that tool an entire computer's uh, organization. So That's the hardware view. Now the next slide, if I remember correctly, no, I'm wrong. <laughs> it isn't what I thought. Okay, so now let's put together some function units uh, into a computer architecture. Here's, within the dotted um, uh, boundaries, is a motherboard uh, architecture of a computer. And let's see what it's got on it. It's got a keyboard controller, which is a digital logic unit, which interfaces, of course, to a unit called the keyboard, which is a peripheral device, an input device. It's got cards for network and graphics and sound, okay? with interfaces to networks and graphic and sound. For example, the graphic interface connects to some kind of a terminal or monitor. And then it's got buses connecting internal things. Notice we've got a CPU, a level 2 cache, uh, um, an I.O. controller, a uh, system chipset, and system buses which are connected to other buses. And the level 2 cache interfaces to our main memory. All right, so we've got main memory, then level 2 cache. So where's level 1 cache? inside the CPU. Okay, we're actually putting our level 1 cache right on the chip. So we've got a memory architecture here from level 1, level 2 to main memory. 
We've got slow peripherals here, USB and serial and game and parallel. These are very slow peripherals. And they'll connect to things like mice and modems and things like that. They come through a multiple I.O. controller for multi-speed and low-speed stuff. Notice it brings in also the hard disk, floppy disk if we had, onto the system bus. And this bus is faster, but this is really fast. Right here, the interface between the uh, system chipset, also sometimes called North Bridge, and the uh, cache, that's going to be the very fastest data transfer in the whole machine, other than internal transfers in the CPU, of course. So there's an example of function units, and the glue, which are the uh, buses uh, and data pathways to connect them together. Okay, now, any questions about that? It's time to change. I'm moving to a different topic here, so let's make sure that the view of a computer, both the software view, which is the ISA, and the hardware view, which we just showed, are understood to be part of the architecture. I'm back to here. The computer's architecture is this plus this. Okay. Any questions? Not that. Okay. All right. Then we'll move into a new area, which is defining the classes of computers. As you see, there's uh, four classes listed there: desktop computers, servers, supercomputers, and embedded computers. Okay. Now, desktop computers. We're all familiar with those. Those would include the portable versions that we take around called laptops. And these are designed to deliver good performance to a single user at a low cost. Okay, usually executing third-party software that they didn't write themselves. They just get some software and put it on it. Uh, usually incorporating a graphics display, a keyboard, and a mouse. Pretty simple. And now the mouse is in integrated, the keyboard is integrated, and the graphics is integrated if it's a laptop. Otherwise, you have little extra things like this if it's a desktop. We all know that category pretty well. But don't think that's the only kind of computer. The second one is servers. Oh, yeah, I've heard of that. Client server and this mail server or this web server. Maybe you never saw one, but at least you're using them. Every time you use the internet, you're using servers. What are servers? Servers are used to run larger programs for multiple simultaneous users. For example, if you're a web server, you may be getting 100 or 1,000, or if you're Google, a million requests to run programs at the same time. So they have to deal with parallel requests. So they serve requests. And typically, you can only access a server over a network. Uh, typically, you don't walk up to a server, hey, server, I want you to do something for me. You come in over the network. So that's the typical way that they're used. And there's a big emphasis on dependability and often security and reliability. Keshke, there was such a dependable, reliable security emphasis here, but this is low cost. So because of low cost, you're not going to get this. But if you tell Google, oh, uh, guess what? Your server is down. I mean, you know, the world's six billion people can't even access it. That's bad news. You tell a bank your servers are down. You tell any business your server's down, that's, that's not good news. So they are going to have high reliable, very dependable, and very secure servers. Those are goals that these categories have that we don't have for desktop computing. Let's move on. Supercomputers. We've all heard of those. World record, right? You know, if you remember, uh, in our electrical engineering department, there's a, a computational electromagnetics group, and the Hoja there holds the world record for, uh, you know, computational uh, computations run uh, in a given uh, for a given program, not given second, because his programs are running on computers that aren't owned by Bill Kim. We don't have a com supercomputer big enough to meet his needs. So he ships off his data and programs to places that have these supercomputers and either rents or gets free time, gets his results, and then can analyze them later. So it's a case of the machine being too big and too expensive. But he's found some and he's used them, and that's how he's broken the world record. Um, do you know who I'm talking about? Anybody remember that Hoja's name? It's been in Bill Kent News, and he's given seminars and everything. So the world record for computing complexity, number of calculations or number of operations is held by one of our Hojas here. And of course they're modeling, you know, planes and their, you know, stealth or radar modeling of this or that. You know, they're modeling very, very, very uh, complex things with many, many elements. So the number of elements is in the millions, the number of calculations is in the billions or the trillions. So they take a long time to run. I remember reading in the Bill Kent News uh, a couple years back that during Christmas break, a supercomputer was available in the UK. So they shipped off the programs and data, said run, 
and it ran for 10 days or six days, you know, one program. And then when it got its results, said, we're done. And then I'm sure another program immediately, you have to make a reservation for that long of a run on a, on a supercomputer. But that's the size of programming that we're talking about. Well, supercomputers are very high performance, very high cost. I mean, we're talking millions, tens of millions, maybe hundreds of millions of dollars even. Uh, they're kind of a server, but they have hundreds to thousands of processors, terabytes of memory, petabytes of storage. Those numbers mean anything? You know, Terra and Peta, yeah, Onuzeri, Onuki, Onuzeri, Onbesh, Onuzeri, Onsekis. We're talking really big ones now, way, way bigger than Giga and Mega. Um, that are used for high end scientific, that's what he's doing, and engineering applications, okay? So high end applications need those kind of computers. Are there a lot of those in the world? Yeah. Not millions, but there's thousands of those in the world. And certainly the top 500, there's a big list and a race, and every year they rank them according to their performance. So you can go online and find top 500 computers and see who's got them and where, what countries they're in and what their performances are. And then finally, the category that I think we're all much more familiar with is the embedded computer category, or embedded processors, and that's where the computer or processor is inside another device. So when you look at it, you say, Huh, that's a cell phone. Oh, that's a PDA. Oh, that's a DVD player. Oh, that's an uh, electronic uh, microwave oven controller. You don't realize what you got is a computer inside a larger box. You look at it and say that's a car, but in fact, in the car are many different processors embedded into the anti-lock braking system, embedded into the airbag control, embedded into the you know, fuel injection system, et cetera, et cetera. So the climate control system, the, you know, uh, whatever satellite uh, navigation system, et cetera, et cetera. So these are a computer that's inside another device, and it's being used for one predetermined application. It's not being continually reprogrammed. Oh, let's you know, write a new program. Let's do you know, uh, our lab 10, or let's do our homework number 5 on an embedded processor. It's not likely to support that. OK, so those are some classes of computers. Now let's start to look at some pictures. This first one is the inside of a Nokia cell phone. Okay, first we'll on the, show the front side, then we'll flip it over and show the back side. Why? Because it's an example of an embedded computer. Let's see what we've got here. Well, obviously here's the screen and here's a speaker or something, to, but the electronic part here contains the following interesting parts. Uh, it's got a processor, an ARM processor. That's a different instruction set architecture. I don't know if you've heard of ARM, but I think they sell uh, a large, large number, way more than Intel and AMD combined number of processors, they sell embedded processors. So that's part of the heart of the digital computation is a processor here. It's the system controller, okay? Then there's a digital signal processor from Texas Instruments, which now processes the uh, signal coming through the uh, microwave uh, airwaves to this and does baseband processing, okay? Baseband means after the high frequency is stripped out, the actual sound signals that are coming over, including the information from the uh, provider, whether it's Turkcell or Avi or whatever, it processes that information. There's the controller, but this one's actually handling the data. Special design digital signal processing for digital, digitized data. Then we've got a static RAM of 256 kilobytes by Samsung, a special RAM chip, Okay, fast, high-speed, static RAM. Remember that from CS223, that that's the fast kind. And then we've got a flash memory, which we know is non-volatile, but way slower. This has got two megabytes of flash, and it's a flip chip BGA, which is some kind of special package, which is this one here. So these chips are, and this is a custom part, which is an analog to digital converter. Here's a custom part, which is a keyboard and interface chip. So these are custom. They're not telling you anything about what's inside them, but they're making them special in order to be on a Nokia phone. You will not go out and be able to buy that or buy that. You can buy that, but not the program. You can buy that, but not the program. Okay, you can buy those two. Those are just memory. All right, that's the front side. Let's flip it over to the back side. On the back side, there's a lot more analog electronics because obviously we're dealing with, you know, the real world signals. So the back side's full of things that we don't study in our department. But if you have an electrical engineering friend, ask him to tell you what's a frequency synthesizer. I guess you can imagine that it makes frequencies. To synthesize means to make, it makes frequencies because it needs to have oscillating tones. A voltage regulator to keep things regulated at a right voltage. A power amplifier, and you can imagine that it boosts signal levels quite a lot. But notice that what the silicon technology, no, I mean, so the semiconductor technology, it's not silicon, it's gallium arsenide. 
Remember that I told you in CS223, gallium and arsenide are column three and column five elements. When you put them together, you get a semiconductor's performance, but with faster switching than silicon, which is a column four element. So faster switching, you pay extra money in order to make this power amp switch fast. Okay? Standing wave amplifier, duplexer from Fujitsu at 900 megahertz, if you know the cell phones in Turkey used to be at 900 megahertz. Now they also have additional frequencies as well. Um, here's a 1900 megahertz band a ceramic uh, radio frequency duplexer module. From, so this is a standard chip. That's a standard chip. These are more standard chips here. Voltage controlled oscillators, standing wave amplifiers. Here's another gallium arsenide up converter. Here's a gallium arsenide, another power amp. And you look at the back side and you say, well, there's nothing digital there. And you're probably right. It's not a digital side. So on your cell phone, one side is the analog circuitry and analog processing. The other side is the digital circuitry and the digital processing. And I think that's very wise to separate those two. This is much more noise sensitive. Do you remember when we talked about one of the advantages of digital signals is they have a noise margin and a noise immunity? Analog signals, if you put some noise in, it's in. And now the signal's got karangelar on it or whatever you call it in Turkish, static. Okay, now embedded processors, because of cell phones, because of personal digital assistants, because of the wide range of consumer electronics that have them in them, from dishwashers to toasters to smart refrigerators and so on, their sales have just skyrocketed. Have a look here at the graph of cell phone sales worldwide in millions, the graph of personal computer sales, oh, that's practically linear and flat, the graph of televisions. And digital televisions have really gone up fast, but uh, not nearly as fast as cell phones. Now, obviously, I don't need eight cell phones. So at some point, it's going to saturate. When everybody in the world has the cell phones that they want, then the sales are going to get flat, and there'll be a replacement market. But right now, kids in China and teenagers in India and adults and old people in South America, and everybody's jumping on the bandwagon. So even in Europe and North America, sales might be flat. They're, they're doing this worldwide, OK? And it still continues. Um, lots of other embedded processor locations. We've mentioned a few. I'll just go on. But here's the point. Here's the point of this slide. Embedded growth is much, much, much faster than desktop growth. So if you're going to make money, don't think you're going to sell processors into desktop computers. Kind of linear, you know. If you want to make some money, get your processors sold into hot items like fast-growing digital electronics and consumer products like cell phones. Did you notice on the um, Nokia slide, was there anything that said Intel? Anything that said AMD? Who's winning? ARM and Texas Instruments. Those were the processors that we saw, weren't they? So, you know, think about it for a minute, okay? Are those the ones inside this computer? No. But it, for the company, they're, they're not concerned so much about where their processors are. They're concerned about how many they're selling, what's the profit margin, what's the company growth, what can we do to keep moving the product line forward. Intel and AMD have had to ask some very serious questions. What are we going to do 20 years from now? Where's our new growth going to be? Where's our company strategy going to be? They're obviously you know, on a very flat kind of a curve for uh, desktop and uh, laptop processors. OK, now embedded processors have some characteristics that are uh, different from the other ones, supercomputers and servers and, and um, uh, desktops. It spans a huge range of applications and performance. That's not true for supercomputers. It has a very narrow range of applications. It's that scientific and engineering high-end stuff. Servers have a pretty narrow range as well. Web-based requests to do something and give an answer. Desktops and laptops have a pretty standard. What are we doing? The Microsoft Office suite, you know, think about it. It's not that much. Kind of the, the, the boundaries are pretty clear, but not at all for embedded. Huge, huge, huge. Car and toaster oven and DVD player and cell phone are completely different corners of the, of the you know, what you want to do with a processor. So they're specializing and guessing where the market's going to go. There's a lot of dynamism about this. And also wide range in performance from little 8-bit ones to 64-bit ones and everything in between. Often these have low performance requirements. They're not asking for high performance. Often they have very stringent requirements on cost because if you're going to sell 10 million, then a two cent difference makes a, is matters, okay? If you're going to sell 10 billion, a tenth of a cent makes a difference. Think about it, okay? So cost matters if, you're, if the volume is really high. They often have stringent limitations on the power because they're running off of batteries and we don't like to run out too quick and make the consumer always be plugging in or buying new batteries. 
and they often have low tolerance for failure because something important is being done by that embedded processor. Can you think of an example? You know, if my PDA dies, it's not going to kill me. But I can think of some embedded processors that will kill me if they don't work right. Can you think of some? How about the airbag controller? If it explodes on me at a time when I didn't have an accident, I'm going to have an accident and maybe I'll kill myself or somebody else. How about the anti-lock brake controller on my car? I could die if that doesn't work right. Hey. So we're talking about a $5 processor on which life depends as opposed to a $500 computer on which life doesn't depend. If this dies, we just call somebody or they bring another one. But I, I don't, there are some places that are life critical. It's got to work. Okay? That's pretty tough. Well, look at it again. Low cost, low power, and high uh, reliability. Now, luckily, high performance is not usually a part of it. But anyway, I'll just point out to you, there's quite some challenges in this area of embedded processors. Okay, any questions about that world? The world of computer categories. Okay, there's some nice stuff in chapter one in the book. I really encourage you to read it. Nice pictures, nice statistics. Goes a different way from these slides. It's supplementary. It's not the same thing again. All right, so I encourage you to read chapter one and get a nice broad view of the world of computers. Anybody have any questions? Wait, this is a new topic, so I like to break and just see if there's any anybody has raised some you know questions or curiosity or want to ask anything about what was just said or what wasn't said but should have been said. Okay, well then we'll go on now. We're going to start to move into the software area here. I think you can see that there are concentric rings here. And um, application software is the blue, system software is the green, and the hardware is the light blue in the middle. Okay, so around the hardware, we, we have system software. Notice this is really just layers, but curling them. Remember our old one was hardware, then operating system, then applications. Three layers. Now, if you roll them around, you get this kind of a uh, diagram. The system software is things like the operating system and the compiler. Okay, Th those are programs that the user doesn't write but needs them to work in order to access the hardware. This diagram shows us that this application software layer does not directly touch the hardware. It touches it through the operating system. Okay, and it's through system software. Um, system software uh, operating system is defined here as a supervising program that interfaces the user's program to the hardware. Linux, Mac OS, Windows, etc. Lots of operating systems. You'll take a course next year in operating systems, CS342. And um, if you're lucky, you'll get Ibrahim Hoja. If you're unlucky, you'll get me. <laughs> we we co-teach that course. Um, and it handles basic I.O. operations. It f manages memory. Uh, it provides for protected sharing so that multiple users can be running their programs on the same processor at the same time. Protected sharing. That means I don't damage your program, you don't damage my program, I don't touch your data, you don't touch my data, but we can both run at the same time on the processor. And then there's other system software, things like compilers and interpreters, and those are just language translators. Okay, I think you, you know that C needs a compiler and Java needs an interpreter. Um, and so it translates the high-level instruction into low-level instructions, which can be actually run by the hardware. Let's do a little bit of that now. Let's look at um, a program at three levels. Here's a classic swap in C. Here's the same swap in assembly language. Here's the same swap in machine language. All right, now, right away, I think you can see, well, machine language is nothing more than ones and zeros. You're right, it is. And it's totally unintelligible. You're right, it is. Now I'm going to tell you a hero story. The first people that worked with computers back in the 1940s programmed in machine language. They flipped switches for ones and zeros in order to set their instructions and set their data and then said, go, take it and do it. They had to understand the ones and the zeros. That didn't last long. They were all you know, really smart people from math and physics departments and engineering, but they got tired of that really quick. They said, we got to be able to ozet and abstract up from that. So the next abstraction level was this, ha, called assembly language, right? And if you notice here, you can get some meaning out of this. Shift left logical, add, load a word, load a word, store a word, store a word, jump, or jump return, okay? Oh, well, what does that mean? Well, I've got a register 2 and a register 5, 
and a number two. What am I doing? Well, I'm probably taking register five and I'm logically shifting it two places and to the left and putting the result in register two. For add, I'm probably taking register four and register two, adding them together and putting it in register two, or maybe register two and register four, you know, depends on, but actually in this language, the syntax is here's the destination, this stuff goes into there if we're writing it into it. So this says put these two together, add them and put it in there. This says load a word, so register 15 is going to get something loaded from memory, and this is how I figure out what the memory address is. And then register 16 is going to get something from memory, and this is that memory address. Notice that it's somehow four different than this memory address. Four bytes different, well that would be one word different, or 32 bits different. And then after I've done two loads, then I do two stores, which is from the processor back into memory, store it into memory, and look what I'm doing. The one that went into 15 goes back to the other location, and the one that went into 16 goes back to the other location. Ah, it's the Chopra's swap. From U to U, from U to U, now back that way. Well, this is a swapping program, but it's Chopra's. Now, what's going on here? Well, this element goes to temp, the next element goes there, and temp goes to there. Ah, that's the triangle swap, isn't it? You go to you, you go to you, now you go to you. And we needed a temporary location to do that. So notice how the compiler translated a triangular swap between these two values became a Chopra's swap at the lower level. Hmm, smart compiler. It didn't directly do the same thing that the high level did. It did something different. Equivalent in meaning, but actually different in, in uh, the implementation. And then this is translated one to one to here. I'm going to just tell you, this first line you see there with 32 bits is this. This second line that you see there with 32 bits is this. Okay, so five lines of C code became seven lines of assembly code, which became seven lines of machine code. Right? So when we translate from here to here, what do we call that? If I translate from here to here, what do we call that? Compiling. If I translate from here to here, what do we call that? Assembling. Assembling. Yes, that's right. So a compiler translates to here, and that's a one-to-many translation. An assembler translates from here to here, and that's a one-to-one -one translation. Okay? Now, did you know most of that already? Or is that something new for you? Not the details, I mean the high concept, the high level concepts. Did you, did you have that idea already? There was a compiler and followed by an assembler. Compiler takes high level statements and turns them into one or more low level statements. An assembler takes one low level statement and translates it into one machine statement. That, that's the basic idea of this slide. Don't worry about the swapping and the syntax of the languages. Okay. Can everybody read the C code and understand it? I hope so. <laughs> I hope you can. All right. All right. We'll, we'll, we'll worry about the details of assembly later, okay. I'll teach you all about that, more than you want to know. All right, so what are some advantages of high-level languages? Right. You've studied two already, C++ and Java. Before you're finished, you'll see a few more, okay. And so programmers program application programs at high-level languages. In fact, you know there's even a search for higher-level languages, meta-languages, and, 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 and more abstract languages. Why? To be closer to the way that we think and, and express, right? You know, yeah, yeah uptal computer, stupid low-level language. How come this syntax error? Can't it be smarter to accept my natural language? Why? Because Java and C++ and all of them are formal languages with rules and if you don't obey their rules, they say, I don't know what you're talking about. But if I break the rules of Turkish, you can still understand me. You do understand what I'm talking about. Maybe that's because there's a fundamental difference between natural and formal languages. Maybe that's because there's a fundamental difference between an intelligent human and a stupid machine. You decide. I'll let you make that choice. But um, obviously, there's something going on there. And we call it the semantic gap. The gap between the level that machines and formal languages can understand and carry meaning at and the level that humans and natural languages can understand and carry meaning at. And they're trying to close that gap. That would be a wonderful thing, wouldn't it, if computers could understand our natural languages and say, yeah, okay, I'll do that. And, and uh, since it'll take you 10 minutes to go downstairs to Mozart and get a coffee, and this will only take eight, is there anything extra you'd like me to do while you're gone? 
or, or, or it already knows. It says, oh, I did that, and also since you want this other thing, I did that too. You go, wow, John of Arc, you're so smart. You know, wouldn't we love that? But most of us are saying, you're so stupid, you're so stupid, right? I, 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 don't, I never tell my computer how smart it is. I tell it how stupid it is all the time, because it's always falling short of my expectations. What's the problem? I'm expecting a human, and it's not a human. I want it to do things that I can do, and it can't. It can do some things faster than me, way faster than me, for sure, way more accurate than me. I make lots of mistakes, but somehow there's still this sense that uh, it's not where it needs to be. Anyway, but high-level languages are better than lower-level languages, so let's talk about some of their advantages. The first thing is it allows the programmer to think in a more natural way, not a totally natural way, but a more natural way, and um, particular to the intended use. For example, some languages are aimed at scientific computation, some languages are aimed at business, some languages, languages are aimed at web, some language, languages are aimed at symbolic manipulation. You can target a language for a specific purpose. That's nice. Of course, they're very much more productive than low-level languages are. A programmer can write and debug and correctly get working um, much more per day or per month or per year if they use high-level languages. So it's just easier to debug and easier to validate and more understandable and more productive. Of course, the, uh, the programs are easier to maintain if they're easier to understand. Nobody can maintain something that they can't understand. Uh, programs can be independent from the computer. Eh, that's a really big one. High-level languages are machine independent, but the assembly and the machine languages are obviously machine dependent, one-to-one. -one. Every architecture, that is, instruction set architecture, has its own machine language and its own sort of, you know, semi-understandable um, assembly language. But there's not a C for Intel machines and a different C for RISC machines and a different C for you know, Sun, no, C is C, and Java is Java. That's the great thing, they're portable. And then the last thing is optimizing compilers, which have emerged in the last years, uh, produce very efficient assembly code. So why write at a low level when you can write at a high level and get all these advantages and be efficient also? One of the claims in the old days was assembly language programs are more efficient. You can get the work done with less lines of code than if you write at a high level and then translate it down. But the, now the translators are becoming so good that they actually produce very efficient low-level code. So very little programming is done today at the assembly level. None is done at the machine level. I told you that the, the switch setting is all finished. But very little is done at the assembly level because of those great compilers. That's the main reason. Now, let's talk about compilers a little bit. Uh, High-level languages have some advantages we just talked about. Programmers don't think in low-level things. Uh, you can target high-level languages specifically, and you just get some advantages. So the compilers are needed in order to convert from source languages that have these advantages into the object code, which is the assembly language of the machine. It, it has to be. Machines don't speak this language, and you and I don't want to work with this language. So therefore, the gap has to be filled with an automatic translator. There's a gap between natural languages and high-level languages, but there's no program yet which can translate. Bire beer and perfectly. There's a gap between high-level and low-level languages, but there's plenty of programs that'll do that, and those are called compilers. Now, why is this gap unfillable by a computer program and this gap fillable by a computer program? Can somebody answer that one? Yeah, okay. This has strict rules, and this has strict rules, and these allow exceptions and flexibility and poetry and music and love songs and all kinds of wild and interesting things, which therefore mean they don't have strict rules. And another way of saying it has strict rules is saying it's a bichim cell deal. It's a formal language. You can define it on paper exactly this, 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 and this is legal, this is illegal. That's the definition. The boundary is really clear. What's legal and what's not legal in C or Java or MIPS assembly is clear. It's defined. It's formal. It's beach himself. So therefore, from one formal language to another can be automatically translated. But from a natural language to a formal language cannot be automatically translated. Now, oh, Hoja, I'm a natural language processing NLP. Don't we have computers that can accept commands? Yeah. If I say to my computer, file, open, 
you know, yeah, but if I say, hey, today I'm thinking I'd like to look at the file that I did yesterday for Excel. I forget what its name was, but can you find that? You know, it's a little bit harder problem, isn't it? Okay, you know, if you name it exactly, say open. Okay, so what do we have? It's some kind of ilkel natural language processing. And what happens, you know, I mean, there's, there's computers that deal with you on the phone. They call me up and try to sell me something, and I say, I'm not interested, and they're smart enough to say, what would you like? You know, there have been a few basic patterns of, I don't want that, or I'm not interested, has been programmed in, it understands, oh, he, that was a negative, let's switch and go somewhere else. But that's really still ilkel. Because if I say, what's your name? It's going to say, would you like? You know what? We're not there. And, and the question is, can we ever get there? And if you're interested in the answer, study artificial intelligence. That's the whole area of trying to narrow that gap. I hope you can see that there's a lot of problems that aren't solved yet, and they need smart people like you to work on them. And so if you're interested in staying on for master's and PhD and researching and cracking or at least shrinking the size of the gap, there's a big need, big need for people like you. Now, you got to keep a decent GPA. You've got to like academics and like study. If you hate it and you've got a low GPA, go out and get a great job and work for a company. Earn some money. But if you're interested in solving these hard problems, there's a lot of hojas around here that would love to talk to you. They say, come, yes, I'm dying for students. I want some people to do research. In fact, you can even start as an undergraduate. I'll tell you, a lot of my colleagues would be happy to have PhD students. They'd be happy to have master's students. They'd be happy to have bachelor's students. So while you're studying as an undergraduate, if you want to start to work on a project, find a hoja who's doing something in an area you're interested in and say, hey, I've got a little bit of spare time and can I participate in the project? I don't know much, but I want to learn and can I help some graduate students or help you and can I get some idea about how this problem is being attacked? Lots of good opportunities. And I did undergraduate research and it really, it really enriched my, my uh, bachelor's program. I was glad that I did. I worked on a research project. I wasn't the only one, of course. There was a Kojaman you know, empire from the you know, Bosch Hoja all the way down to the lowest undergraduate like me. And a master's and PhD students and lots of staff. But it was exciting to be a part of that project. And I, I really enjoyed that. I hope that you'll consider at least something like that too. All right. Um, now, going on with... Um, applications become more concise and they have fewer bugs. Programs can be independent of the system and compilers allow this and libraries, of course, you all are using lots of Java and um, C++ library code. They simplify common tasks. All right, here we go. The high-level program is written. Here it is, the triangle swap. A compiler changes it into the assembly language program. Here it is, the Chopra's swap. An assembler program changes it into the machine language program and these four lines became these four. Now, if you count the bits, 4, 8, 12, 16, yeah, there's 32 bits. That's because this machine is a 32-bit machine. So its instructions are all 32 bits. They're broken up into groups of four so that you can see them. But it turns out that the code for this and this and this and this part are found in here. And the code for this and this and this and this part are found in here. Yeah, so there's a one-to-one -one relation. That's actually fairly simple to translate. The harder one is this. So writing an assembler is easier always than writing a compiler because a compiler has to be able to do this and go to here and uncompiling means going from here to here. Assemblers have a much easier job. They go from here to here. Disassemblers are not too hard either. They go from here back to here. So you can, these are mechanical machine translations and you can go both ways. So if you have some machine code, you can go back and find out the high level code from that. And that's called reverse engineering. You may have heard of it, reverse engineering. You take maybe your competitor's product, open it up, find the code stored, get the bits, reverse engineer and find out what they've done for their algorithm. Notice though we didn't stop here. This is the machine that runs where? On the ISA. This is the lowest level language. So the machine code runs on the hardware, but there's one more translation. Look what happens. The machine interprets this instruction, interprets it just like Java is an interpreted language, just like BASIC is an interpreted language. It interprets it and forms what? Control signal specifications. In the hardware, I need to say, would you please and together the mask bits with the instruction register bits 9, 10, and 11 and put that result in the ALU op register in the first four bits. Hey, what are we doing here? An and and a register transfer, and two sources and a destination, okay? And control lines having values high and low will determine if we do this and when we do it. So you might say, this instruction here got changed into a set of controls which say you do, you do, you do, you don't do, you don't do, and that's how 
this will happen. That's how this will happen. So what is it? It's a store word. That means take a value from register 15 and send it back to memory to this location. So we're writing something from the processor out to the memory. That means it's got to be put on the memory bus, the address has got to be put, and uh, memory signals activated. Okay. Any questions about that slide? That's a nice one because it shows how high-level software turns into machine signals down inside the processor. Don't forget, here's the boundary. This is the hardware, this is the software, and here's our ISA boundary. Any, anybody have any comments or questions or anything about that slide? That's another good slide, another one to remember. That's a significant slide for meaning and big picture of where our course is going. Okay, let's go on. Now, this one's classic. This was around when I was a student. Um, this is called the execution cycle. This is the basic understanding of what a computer processor does in one instruction, and then it does it over and over and over. We fetch the instruction. That means we get it out of storage, which is memory. So we fetch an instruction and bring it into the processor. We decode it. We understand it has different fields. Remember there was a slide that said opcode field, the first register, the second register. Yeah. We decode it and find the parts and learn what we're supposed to do. We determine the required actions and how big the instruction is in case there's more to fetch. Now we know what we need. We're going to, let's say, add A and B and put it in C. So now you have to go get the operands. I need A and I need B. So you go locate and you find that data. Where might A and B be? Where could they be? I need A, I need B because I'm going to add them. First I have to get them. Where might they be? Could be in registers. That's one place. Could be inputs, maybe, yeah. Or could be, where's the last place? If they're in register, they're in the processor. If they're in inputs, they're in the I.O. So where's the other place? They're in memory, yeah. Okay, now normally speaking, we don't take things directly from input right to the processor. Remember that slide that had the memory in the middle? So inputs go not straight to the processor. Inputs go to memory. Yeah, so actually our two sources would be it's already in the processor in my register, or it's in memory. I've got to get it into the processor. Okay? That's the two choices. Input is possibility, but normally it's not done because it's too slow. Okay, so we're going to get the, get the operands that we need. So notice we fetch the instruction, then we fetch the operands. Now we can actually do it. We can add A and B. So we execute. We compute the result. Value or maybe status. You know, status, what would that be? Compare A to B. If it's bigger, let me know. So that would be a status result. You didn't change A, you didn't change B. Or add them would make a result. Then, store that result. Okay, so A is added to B, now we've got it, we're supposed to put it in C. So we have to deposit the result in the place that we're putting it. Where could the places be to deposit a result? Registers, put C in the, put the thing in the register which is for C. Or memory, put it in the memory location which is for C. Exactly, same two choices. Okay, and then finally, determine what is the next instruction. Now, determine the next instruction. What does that mean? I mean, I thought after this one, we do this one. Isn't that always true? No, because if this one says branch, we don't do this one. We go somewhere else. If this one says jump, we don't do this one. We go somewhere. So actually, each instruction may go to the one right after it, or it may go somewhere else. Branches and jumps involve what we call change of control. Change of control. So there's sequential instructions, and then there's branches. What happens if the branch is a backward branch? What do we call that? Loop. What happens if the branch is a forward branch? What do we call that? I'll draw it a little differently. What happens if the branch is a forward branch? We call it an if or a decision, don't we? Yeah. What happens if the branch is a multi-way branch? Test this, and if it's that, do that. Yokes, if it's that, yeah, switch case, right, exactly. So branching where you go on is either if or switch case, which is nothing more than nested if. <coughs> branching back is looping. Okay, so now we've got the basic structures that we, that we have to have for any flow of control. Dung, 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 that's called sequential. That's called looping. That's called decision branching. Okay, so that's all that you need. The theory of computing says those three are enough to do any algorithm in any program. So we, that's an important step, determine where do I go next. Then, once I find it, I go get it, 
decode it, get its operands, execute it, store its result, and then figure out who's next after that. This is called the basic instruction cycle. Now, is there any parallelism to this? Is there any parallelism to this? Can I fetch two and be decoding them in two different decoders? Can I be fetching at the same time that I'm executing? Can I be determining the next one at the same time that I'm... No, this is totally hard to shill. Do this, then 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 do this. Now you're done with instruction number one. Go back and do this, then do this, then do this, then do this. Now you're done with the second instruction. Go back and... You got it? This is the model for a sequential computer. There's no parallelism in this model. So therefore it's simple, slow. I think we can see that right away, can't we? It's not going to be very fast if we just do this. What's the only way to make this go faster? If we don't allow parallelism, what's the only way? No, I said no parallelism. If we don't allow any parallelism, what's the only way to make this go faster? Hmm? Yeah, exactly. Instead of do this, do this, do this, you go do this, do this, do this. Watch this. You know, I'm going to walk across the room. Is there any way to make it go faster? Sure. You know, just make the person go faster. You know, if we fetch and execute and we speed up the, as he said, quality of the hardware with a faster frequency, that's the only way to make this go faster. But that it totally ignores the idea of parallelizing and doing things like fetch three and now decode them all in parallel and now get their operands and execute. Oh, that would be great. Then we could, for every cycle, we did three or whatever. I mean, try this one. While I'm fetching this one, the one I just fetched, I'm decoding it, and the one I fetched two times ago, I'm operating on it, and the one I fetched three times ago, I'm exit. Yeah, okay. That's overlap. There's lots of ways to parallelize this. I just want you to get the basic model first. We are interested in performance. We are interested in making computers go fast. I don't know anybody that wants them to go slow. So let's don't consider anything that's slower than the possible, the fastest possible uh, implementation. So we're going to take this just as a basic model. Let's go on. Time's just about out. Um, okay, so the five components of a computer, once again, summary here. We've got processor with uh, control and data path, which is where we're actually going to fetch and execute and do that thing. But it needs sometimes to get things from memory or give things to memory. And sometimes they're not in memory. They need to come in from the outside or when we're finished, we need to put them to the outside. So this is the rest of the world, the I.O. This is the inside of the computer here with memory feeding the need for data and instructions to our processor. Processor's got two parts. The control signal says, do this, do this, and do that. And this is where the actual register transfer instructions will be implemented. <coughs> right now, let's have a quick look at a slide about the AMD Barcelona multi-core chip. Uh, you can see that core number one, core number two, core number three, and core number four take up about 70 75% of the area in the chip. You notice that each core has got a 512K level two cache. Level 1 is actually on board on the core along with the processor. So we've got processor and some memory. When we say processor, that means registers, control, data path. That's all in the core, plus some level 1 cache. Here's level 2 cache. So we've got a cache for each of the cores. And then there's a 2 megabyte shared level 3 cache. Aha! Level 1 is here. You own it totally. Level 2 is outside. It's slower, but it's totally yours. Here's level 3. We all share that. Now. How are we going to share anything? How are we going to send data around? The answer is right here, North Bridge. A bridge chip is a chip that interfaces bus components together and decides who can talk to who, when, and does it as fast as possible. So obviously, all four of them need to get to the level three cache, and get level three cache has to be able to go to all four. So therefore, this bridge is going to interface five things. It's going to interface that one, that one, that one, that one, and that one. That's what its job is, a five-way junction, like a five-way road traffic controller. But, of course, as you can see, it's done with hundreds of thousands of transistors. It's a digital sequential system, complicated but not unlike the ones that we did in CS223. So there's a Barcelona for you. The details are four out-of-order cores. That means the core can execute instructions out of order. It doesn't have to do this one, then this one. If they're independent, it can say, I'll do that one first, then that one. So four cores on one chip. 
The clock rate is not slow, 1.9 gigahertz, 65 nanometer technology, but of course that's shrinking, shrinking, 40, and now sub 40, 30, going down, down, down. So the, as they go down, 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 it gets smaller and you get room to put some new stuff on. So maybe the next generation will be eight cores. Three levels of caches. We already talked about level one, level two, and level three. Level one and level two are personal to your core. Level three is a shared one. And then there's an integrated north bridge. So it's not an external chip, but the bridge is inside this uh, multi-core chip. There's an architecture at a very high level. Anybody want to know about the transistors? Let's go down to the transistor level. Come on. Yeah, let's get down there and analyze. Okay, do you see the joke? Yeah, I mean, this is the level you can understand that. If we start getting down, what does this do right here? We're lost. It's too low. There's not enough abstraction. So this abstraction level will work for us. All right, that's a good place to stop. Um, I think we'll wrap up the lecture. Thank you. Tell your friends to come. I want to see everybody here for the next one. Too bad half of them missed it. Tell them where they can get the lecture. Tell them about the slides. Tell them about the option for the other sections. You're heroes. I'm glad you came on the first day of class. Have a nice weekend, everybody. Bye-bye.